the dog fights are the yeah the dog fights amazing. for sure they've got to be i mean and he it's... refused to do any cgi so these are real mm. spitfires yeah the three aren't they the three remaining spitfires two are world? spitfires i was reading about this two are spitfires one is a sort of reconditioned other type of plane that was made to look like ah, a spitfire oh, okay. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History Film Club. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. This month's film is on the anniversary of Dunkirk, so I'm discussing Christopher Nolan's 2017 masterpiece with the acclaimed director Tim Hewitt. This is following on from Saturday's chat with James Holland when we discussed the build-up to Dunkirk and the what-if had the evacuation not happened. Coming up, I've just returned from an outing to the cemeteries and memorials of the First World War in Belgium and France. So you can head over to my Instagram and Twitter if you want to see some pictures. But I'll also be putting out a bonus pod whilst out in Flanders. Coming up on Saturday, I have a chat with a fellow podcaster on Napoleon and his generals. Plus, there's much, much more to come. Please rate and review and check out the Patreon where you'll find bonus content. But until then, I'll hand you over to me talking Dunkirk with Tim Hewitt. Right, welcome back, Tim. This is the next film club. It is Dunkirk. We're in May, and I've timed this. So this is coming out, dear listeners, right at the time of at the end of May, which is when the evacuation at Dunkirk occurred. This is the Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. Came out in 2017. And this is this is your film club for this month. So I'm here with Tim Hewitt. Acclaimed director. Hi, thanks for having me. And Tim is straight off a shoot, so he's filled with technical knowledge. Um, <laughs> so Tim will kick off. Dunker, Christopher Nolan. This is this was this is came out before Tenet, I think. And so Yeah, that's the one he made just before Tenet. Exactly, yeah. And I don't know about you, but I found Dunkirk good on repeated when i first watched it i wasn't a bit i wasn't sure about it i i I would probably have given it two and a half out of five but wow. having watched yeah. it again it mm. keeps on going up a notch each time i watch it gets better and better yeah i i sort of agree i i i liked it probably more than you when it first came out i was awed by the spectacle of it but i i do think it's a film that needs to be seen again to really appreciate what he's doing. You know, sometimes the, I think a lot of people thought that on their first viewing, they were maybe took a little time to adjust to the whole time concept that he's using, you know, to, to know that a mole is actually a peer, you know, and not a spy of some sort. And then, and then the whole one hour, one day, one week, and that it's all happening at the same time because you do try to sort of figure it out when you're watching it going when is that happening so what when's this sequence happening related to the other sequences but i actually thought it was a great as a, an amazing spectacle when i first saw it but yeah it sort of grew on repeated viewings for sure yeah well i th- i now think it's a masterpiece i think it's brilliant but mm. but first first time i didn't think that but the timing thing is it's obviously christopher Nolan is obsessed with time every yeah. single Maybe it was very, Batman. very, I mean, from his very bizarre, for one of his short films that he made while he was at university, uh, I think it's got clocks ticking or a clock ticking, which has become a sort of signature thing uh, in most of his films, particularly, you know, things like Inception, Tenet for sure. I mean, there is a time obsession somewhere. Yeah, you don't see it in the Batman films, though, do you? It's just more linear, though, aren't they? No, but there is a... I think, you know, at the beginning of the... I want to say at the beginning of The Dark Knight, he's... When, when there's the robbery happening, is there not something happening with the clock? I, I want to say there's, like, a ticking or something, but maybe I'm... It's interesting just... you mentioned the ticking, because I read somewhere that in this film, he had a timepiece, an old-fashioned pocket watch, a family oh, really? heirloom or something, yeah. And... Hans Zimmer recorded mm. the the ticking of the time, and that apparently plays throughout the whole movie. But I was watching, oh really? 
Well, I was watching again last night and I couldn't detect it. So maybe mm-hmm. it's very faint and you have to be in the... Well, he's definitely... Uh, I mean, the, there's a very famous example in Interstellar when they land on the water planet, which is heavily influenced by the gravity of the black hole nearby. And he's puts in ticks, a ticking clock, that is just over one second between each tick because that represents a day passing on Earth because of the time dilation. I need to watch um, that film again because I, I was <laughs> unconvinced by Interstellar. It, that's also, I do genuinely think, a film that needs repeated viewings and you will. I did not like it the first time I saw it. I thought it was a little bit overly sentimental and whatever, a, bit, a bit Hollywoody, a bit non-Christopher Nolan. And then I watched it again and then again and it, I, I've completely changed my opinion of it. Maybe that's you need to do that with him. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, Interstellar is not going to be a, sh- a film that's on your podcast. <laughs> I no, don't think. No, okay. no. Um, but that's um, the future. Yeah, it, it was the same with Tenet. I saw Tenet, and and I think it's brilliant now. Absolutely. Yeah, you like it more than more than I do. I think. Right. right. Well, so Dunkirk. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so hmm. uh, it is starring. It's got. I don't know one. I don't think it ticks the box of your ensemble cast. But it does star a number of heavyweights. It's got, it's okay. So it stars Kenneth Branagh, Killian Murphy, Mark Rylance, Tom Hardy. Those are the big names. There's a pop star in it who I am not familiar with called Harry Styles. I believe he's quite big now. There yeah, I think he's relatively famous, isn't he? Yes. He, he was in, he's in the modern day equivalent of Take That, I think. And yeah. Fionn, and- Fionn, yes. And Fionn Whitehead. Uh, I think it's who, pronounced Finn. Oh, oh, is it? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think and so. Jack Loudon. I'm a big fan of Jack Loudon. I think he's really excellent good. actor. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And F- Finn Whitehead in this is is our sort of basically us, isn't he? Yeah, I guess he's he's our eyes, and um, the every man that the the every man but the the extremely youthful soldier that of course we forget about Dunkirk. Well, we forget about the wars, I suppose that they were so young, uh, all of them, most of them anyway. And he's, I guess he's he's the kind of protagonist, I guess, in a way, but even though it is a multi, it, and it's not an ensemble, but it's a multicast point of view film. Michael Caine appears as a voice. Uh, he on does, the and you know, I'm glad you brought him up, because obviously, <laughs> so he's a voice, he plays the commander of the three Spitfires. Yes. You can't actually see him given that they didn't have 80-odd-year-old pilots in, in the Battle of Britain or in pre-Battle no. of Dunkirk. And he gets shot down. And as he does in ba- the Battle of the Britain, the Battle of, of the Britain, the Battle of Britain. The Battle of, the Battle of Britain, yeah, he does indeed. He's shot down in that as well. So yeah. he's got a 100% failure rate as a pilot. In- as a, uh, or as an RAF officer. And then uh, Mark Rylance, and then, of course, Irish Killian debut. Murphy. Uh, no, sorry, the, the boy who jumps aboard. Oh, Mark Barry Rylance's, Keen. Yeah, I think it was, his, it was his first film. He was actually still at drama school, I think, when they got him. He's very, very good. good in the, the hunting of a sacred deer, I think it is. Killing of a sacred deer. Killing, yeah. yeah, that's the one. And then the Banshees of Inishiran, which he was very good in. The time thing you mentioned. Now, what I don't understand is when I first watched it, it took me, I think, by about nearly the end of the film i finally worked out what was going on but on on repeated viewing it does clearly state if you're on land it's a week if you're in the air it, it, it's an hour so if you're on land it's a week if you're in the sea it's it's a day and if you're in the air it's an hour so i i rather sympathize with christopher lonan if people are complaining oh i'm a bit confused he has basically put in a sign at the beginning saying there's separate time frames where you are yes i i do agree but at the same time it isn't something that we're particularly used to seeing if we've ever seen it before in fact in films so i think it does take a little while to adjust that that it's not happening happening simultaneously because of course you do obviously there there are (laughs) there's evidence and clues that you jump from a daytime scene in the air to a nighttime scene on the boat, as in the, the uh, Finn Whitehead's boat, not Mark Rylance's. So you know that they're happening at different times. But I do think that it takes, as an audience member, a little while to adjust 
exactly to what's going on. And then the fact that, of course, that it flips around in time that you see the one incident happening from one person's point of view. And then later in the film, you see it from another person's point of view because the times intersect. But I still, I do think it takes a while to adjust. Well, I th that's why I think it, it needs to be seen more than once to really fully appreciate his his narrative style. But once you do, you just sort of, you know, it's nothing that you need. I don't think it's something that you need to properly calculate and and pause the film and say, well, now, okay, now, hang on, I don't understand what's happening. When's this happening? Just as long as you know kind of vaguely what, what he's getting at, you, I think that's it. You then enjoy the film. Yeah, um, I don't even need think you need to know that you are watching the same ship sink three times. I don't think you need to know exactly. that, even though no. that's what happens. Yes, exactly. Yeah, It's all about the suspense. I mean, really, it's about the tension, isn't it, with yeah. the building that he builds. I mean, essentially, to me, I think, you know, people have other people have said this. It's it's a, it's the third act of a film played out for the whole of a film. You know, in most most circumstances, this would be the third act of another film. So why is that? So talk me through that. I don't quite understand that. I mean, the music, the tension, the music starts at the beginning. It's extremely. Yeah. But well, what I mean, I guess, is the action that's played out. You know, in, in most other films, filmmakers would have you, we would have seen soldiers in their battalions or wherever, probably trying to get to Dunkirk. And then the last third of that film would be them trying to get off and out and back home. But Nolan's made that section the whole film. And that's why the tension, I guess, is is so intense for the whole film, because he stretched out essentially a climax over the course of two hours or no not even sorry not two hours because it's actually quite a short film really for, for, for a Christopher Nolan film but I think and I think that's why you know the music helps I think it's what's called the shepherd the shepherd tone is what Hans Zimmer used which is uh, the it's like the Penrose steps in Inception that they never end it's the shepherd tone is the chromatic crescendo and as ascension of notes that seem to go on forever it's so powerful um, in this film. Very it clever. Really yeah, I mean, it should have got an Oscar for score, in my opinion. I, I think was he nominated? I don't know, but he should have done. Who got the Oscar? Uh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's hugely, hugely powerful. Yeah, I'm really surprised that this film didn't. I mean, the year that it was up for all the awards, I think, and I love Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri, but that won the Baftas for for director. And I think film, I'm very surprised the Brits didn't give the awards to Nolan that year. You know, you can't get more of a British patriotic film <laughs> and, and BAFTA kind of. Well, there was some, I tell you what, there were some weird takes on Dunkirk. So mm. there was an argument that it was a Brexit movie. And oh, gosh. Okay. I know it's crazy. And <laughs> there is, and, and, and know listeners, that Nigel in case, Farage was in case very, the listeners think that both of us are massive Brexiteers, we're not at all. Right. No. <laughs> uh, so, but bringing Brexit into Dunkirk is insane. Yeah, it's a little bit odd. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it's a very, it's, it's a tale that's extremely important to the British people who care about these things. You know, it's there's that what's it called the Dunkirk spirit, exactly. You know that that we're all a bit obsessed with that we we kind of want to. It's almost as if we want to go back and do it again, <laughs> do it again, just because we're so proud of it. You know, I, we can't I, really let it go. But I um, hate to I hate to name drop or not name drop or, or or sort of blow my own trumpet. But I was being interviewed by a Spanish a Barcelona based news site. And I was saying that we are obsessed with our glorious victories. Uh, sorry, glorious defeats in yes. in in Britain. Just mm. love the charge of the light brigade. You know, all, yeah, all, yeah, all this yeah. kind of thing is is right up our street. And this this mm. does speak to that. But just going back to the music, you mentioned the the Oscars in twenty. Mm -hmm. I think it was the twenty eighteen Oscars. Yes, Dunkirk won. It won for best sound editing. But for best original score, it, it didn't win. It was nominated. No. Shape of Water won. I oh, don't really. remember the score in that. No. 
I mean, I uh, sound editing absolutely spot on. The, the the actually all of the sound design, to be honest, in it is fantastic. I do remember yeah, watching it the very first time. Mixing as well. Right, and deservedly so. I do remember the first time I saw it in the cinema, which was I saw it in an IMAX cinema. I remember the sounds of the Luftwaffe when they're approaching the mole for the first time. The that bombers, squeaking yes. is, is horrendous, but so powerful and just so, so awesome. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was great. Cinematography, I thought, was fantastic. Some of his shots were amazing. You know, the, the tilting of the when the boat's sinking, the kind of really skewered angle of the camera where the water's rushing in. And a very, it's almost like a nightmare. It's, a, it's something is isn't right. You know, it's not normal, <laughs> which I thought was very powerful. But of course, it's not a, you know, he's not a violent director. And, you know, he doesn't put in gratuitous, you know, I think there's hardly any blood in the film, really, to be honest. But you f- think there is. You think it's the the horror is there, sort of under the surface. Um, Killian Murphy's performance as a as a what would they call it shell shock in those days. I mean, he's amazing. I think um, he's really good. He's lucky because he looks very young. Because I was a bit skeptical. Because he's, I think mm. he's our he's our age. I think he's yes. About- we're very young though, aren't we? Yeah, we 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 are we are. <laughs> but we, I think he would have been playing someone in the mid twenties. Mm. In his mid twenties, and he pulls. Yeah, he's got a youthful face, though. Even now, yeah, I mean, he's helps. lucky. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, and I just wanted. There was one shot that I really only noticed watching it most recently. Is you know the Finn Whitehead, our sort of hero, mm. and then the, the the guy who doesn't say a word because he's French. They yeah. carry a stretcher. Yeah. Yes, mm. yes, they carry a stretcher onto the the hospital ship in in, in a ruse to try and get out. And they're booted off the ship and the ship is then, as we learn later, sank. But there's a shot of the guy they've carried on just just as this boat's sinking. Yeah. And you know, you know, he's been carried on there under false pretenses. The guy's had he's got chest wounds, he's been shot a few times in the chest. And yeah. you just know he's gonna die, and he's just sitting there. It's just a really nice shot. There was like a second on him. Which yeah. I only only appreciated well after. Amazing attention to detail. Um, I don't think. I mean, I, we're going back just very quickly about you know the whole, the British, the the new uh, mentioned of Brexit thing. I don't think Christopher Nolan in any way, shape, or form. Well, I might be wrong to be honest, but I don't think in any way, shape, or form he made the film with any any notion that of a notion of being a patriot or. Or, or, or accentuating anything to do with the Britishness of it all. I just think he was wanted to tell a very suspenseful story, uh, you know, with with a very famous um, historical event as a backdrop. Because I mean, a... there isn't really any there, it, the, the 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 improbability of the outcome. I think was one probably the 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 stepping off point of ma- of ma- telling a story that was extremely suspenseful. Because Dunkirk was so, it was a lost cause almost, you know. I mean, at that point, you know, the Germans should have killed us off, I guess. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm well, really famously, wrong. they stopped because they yeah. did, yeah, they didn't have infantry support. So the tanks were waiting outside Dunkirk. So we'll, mm. we'll, we'll go into a little bit of history. It is a fascinating episode where. There was this phony war prior to Dunkirk happening, mm-hmm. the, well, the Dunkirk evacuation. So we're in May, late May. I think it, I think the evacuation begins around 26th of May. There's a yeah. very good book. I recommend a book written by Hugh C. Bag Montefiore called Dunkirk. It's excellent. I, I can't recommend that enough uh, for anyone listening. So, but but the war had been declared in September 39. So. Yeah. One might wonder, well, why why is it taken sort of seven or eight months to even get to this stage? Is because most of the time, both sides did nothing, sitting behind the Siegfried Line and the Maginot Line, which were lines in in on the border of Germany and France. Which were the idea was that they had these huge gun emplacements that meant that there would be no invasion between the two countries, but. There was an assumption that similar to 
1914 that the on behalf of the allies was that the germans wouldn't go through the ardennes forest because you couldn't get tanks through there and obviously the germans completely ignored military orthodoxy and advanced and the rest is history i think within two weeks they defeated the french the british the belgians and not and the dutch and the dutch and belgians were knocked out of the war then the french were obviously knocked out quickly after so the the panic at dunkirk is a absolutely i mean it's completely accurate i mean the the british mm. army was in complete panic i mean there there've only been a couple of other films that i've that i'm familiar with that have really dealt with dunkirk well which is well, dunkirk dunkirk the, <laughs> the john mills film, the john mills film really, yeah really really good yeah, something and then, different to this. Yes, yes, that's of a sort of platoon sort of trying to retreat. But it's back really good, though. I think it's a really good, especially the, the I think the, the John Mills sections and his his bunt, you know, his, his there's like only a few of them that are trying to get yeah. uh, to the coast. But it's really, suspect when they, I think this is the, this is the section where they go they, into the house, they find food. And then you know they have some eggs or something, and then and then the Germans approach, and it's like it's it's properly suspenseful that that, that section in a different, very different way to this film. But I still I think it's a really good film as well. Yeah, it's um, excellent. It's excellent. Fifty made in 1957, hmm. I think. And then and then and then more recently, Atonement, which it's not a Dunkirk set film, but there no, is a set piece. There's a section there. Yeah. And, and I think it's brilliant. Oh, you like? Oh, uh, yeah. It, it, it's uh, it's the well, the famous uh, jo- Joe Wright. Joe Wright. Joe Wright's one take where he follows jo- James McAvoy along the beach, which was an accident. Well, not an accident, but it was like, look, we can't keep. I think it was time issues. Like, I can't set up, do these setups. Let's do it in one shot. Yeah, it was effective. Excellent. Um, I love stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so well, let, let's get cracking with our categories. Um, but just think before we do that, I'll just mention that mm. this film. I think it cost around a hundred million. I was trying to find out how much it it cost to make, and there are estimates. Yeah, um, and it's a bit it seems to be around a hundred million, but it took in half a billion, five hundred million at the box office. Yeah, he's a clever guy because he's really the only filmmaker I think that manages to make blockbuster level films that have a a lot of brain in them if you know what i mean thoroughly looking forward to i don't know what you mean by brain as in they're not just you know superficial bit pieces of entertainment they are thought-provoking very very almost i don't want to say academic because that's going too far but you know it's we're getting close to that sort of level of filmmaking interstellar i think is very similar with the detail to the si- the accuracy of the scientific side of things I- i'm look really looking forward to oppenheimer coming in july which you know just looks like it's going to be an enormous film but it's about a science a physicist you know i think he's one of the only filmmakers that gets away with doing that these days yeah so the i don't know dunkirk is i would say it- it- it's a blockbuster which you know you can see by the by the by the take <laughs> the box office take but it's quite remarkable that it, it he pulls it off i you know i don't think other filmmakers would be able to pull this sort of a scale this yeah. type of film and this this scale amazingly Anyways, successful yeah amazingly successful i think you know deservedly so i do think that he his his g- little bit of a genius casting was harry styles because the people who probably this is the pop star yes the pop star his hit the fans that worship the harry styles had harry styles not been in this probably would never have gone to see the film i i know that's a slight overgeneralization yeah no no i'm sure you're right that's very clever piece of casting and i thought harry styles was very good in it actually yeah he Um, was he he was was good actually he was good he was good he's an Um, he does this excellent look where when they're in the ship having their jam on jam sandwiches or jam on bread and and he's like where's 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 our mate or something he says he's he's trying to he's finding the nearest exit just in case and harry styles looks at the door in sudden realization shit that's true 
it's like a really good momentary bit, bit of panic. Oh, um, nice. So you, you appreciate his performance. I like that. Yeah, okay, that's so, probably a good direction as well. But you know. So we'll, 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 we'll go into our first category, which is best performance. But just before we do that, and I know I've said mm. that before, but in the Oscars, The Shape of Water got best film. Yes, it did. Yeah. And um, Guillermo del Toro got best director as well that year. Right. So maybe mm. it's a strong year. The other films nominated for best film were Call Me By Your Name. Mm-hmm. It was a good film. Darkest Hour, another another Dunkirk. Wait, no, so that's okay. that's a Dunkirk double bill, really. I mean, it's so Chuck, Gary Oldman one. Yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no yeah. Dunkirk involved. You don't see it. It's not filmed, no. but it's all in the context. But funnily enough, in 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 the same year, we get the same Churchill speech. Exactly yeah. said in yeah. one by Churchill and one read way. by. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, don't worry. We'll be talking about that at the end okay. of this discussion. Sure. Uh, get out. That sort of horror film. Yeah, one best screenplay, racism. I think, that, that, um, that year. Lady Bird, Phantom Thread. Excellent film. Love that film. Yeah, Daniel yeah. Day Lewis, The Post. Fantastic film. The Post. And also a great Bill, film, yeah. Yeah, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, mm. Missouri. So actually, that was quite a strong year. I mean, there's far too many nominations these days, but, yeah. um, but yeah, that's a strong really... year, isn't it? Yeah, really good. Really good year. Um, I... I yes, I mean it's all debatable, really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean Dunkirk, yeah. I thought was was really strong. So, but like one this, one of the strongest that. Year. But it's it's not a film for acting in a way in a weird way. In the in the like I was thinking about our Simon Baker Award is newly sponsored by Simon Baker. Mm-hmm. So the Simon Baker <laughs> Award for best performance. Yeah. And. And if the listeners are wondering who the hell is Simon Baker, he's he won our award for best performance from Margin Call because he was so good in that. I'm yeah. slightly obsessed with him. And now he it's the Simon Baker Award for best performance. And I was struggling to work out who would be the best performance. I, I mean, I, my nomination is Mark Rylance, but that's because he probably gets the most lines. Um, well, I get, mm, I suppose he get he gets m- some of them. I mean, you could argue that Jack Loudon has a similar amount of lines. I think he's excellent. I love the way he's, he's almost drowning. And then he's helped by the boy and his first words are good afternoon. That is a great uh, scene. You know, terribly British, isn't it? In World War Two, in yeah. particular. Yeah, I, I appreciated um, that. I, 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 I think Killian Murphy was really good in his cameo. I mean, it is a cameo, let's be honest. But I think he is excellent in it. I, he's never put a foot wrong, in my opinion, in anything. He's so good. He's um, my favorite film of him, his is uh, the Wind That Shakes the Barley. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and I, and I was so upset that I missed what a friend of mine described as hands down the most incredible stage performance he's ever seen is when Killian Murphy did a play in London where he, it was just him. It was a one man play called happy man, I think. And apparently he was astounding. Yeah. I love, I think he's excellent. And I'm, I'm so happy he's landed the lead in Oppenheimer um, because he's, he deserves leads. In films, he looks a little bit like Oppenheimer. A little yeah, bit. Yeah. yeah. What so, I mean, what really astounds me, if you watch the trailer and it's and the voice starts narrating the film, I thought, oh, I wonder who's narrating. And it's him. His voice is astonishing. It's very different to what he usually sounds like. But so, I don't think he said uh, a I don't think he says enough. And B, he, he's no. barely in it in this film. Yeah, it's uh, it's tricky. I mean, you, you, you could say the same thing about tom hardy especially the fact you never see his face he is, he is so good in it though yeah so it's I very good be, i could be good. i could be swung he does he does have the best line in the film which is i'm on him yeah he's on me i'm on i'm him. on him <laughs> <laughs> it's so good it's so yeah. good uh, we're gonna come to best scene that's 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 next okay 
Fantastic. Um, but um, so, uh, so best... Branner, Branner's great. He always is. Branner's great, but but he is he's you know he's also you could argue along the same lines. I mean, I probably am leaning towards Mark Rylance as well. What about the Lee? We've um, not even mentioned Finn. 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 Fionn, Finn. Had... <laughs> yeah, he he's. I mean, he's really kind of perfect in the role. I know that Nolan said he didn't want stars. He wanted unknowns for that so that we kind of get to know him in a completely fresh way without any preconceived ideas. He is excellent in it. He doesn't have a lot of lines, <laughs> even though he's in the whole film. He, he well, that's really what I was thing, saying. Actually. I don't think anyone has a lot of lines. Basically, it's not yeah. a film for actors. It's more a film for yeah the event. Absolutely. I mean, that's why he, the, the script was something like 70 pages long because yeah. it's there's so little dialogue in it and it was mostly action descriptions, of course. A little bit like the film... All is lost with Robert Redford. There's like two lines in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm leaning towards Mark Rylance, to be honest, because he's, I mean, you know, it is a complete character. You know, he's, when, when, they, when his son is like, you know, no, 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 dad, he's, he's, he's not, there's no movement, or he's probably, he can't have survived that. And he's like, I know, Peter. Yeah. You might be able to help him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he's, uh, he's, he's always good. He's always yeah, he's great. Good. Yeah. Okay. So we'll give it to him. Right. So best scene. So I had a few best scenes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the first, the first one was the stu the first Stuka bomb attack on mm -hmm. the beach where they, um, Finn, our hero is down on the beach with his head in his hands and you, the camera goes sort of, is it slow motion? I think it goes into slow motion. I and... think uh, what well, I, I think it's maybe slightly. It's when yeah. the bombs are dropped and the bombs yeah. approach and then blow up a guy. Unbelievable. The shot's held completely still. Yeah, yeah. That, um, that, that's a fantastic yeah. scene. That's 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 almost that's best shot. More. Than oh the best right, scene. yeah. It's not really a scene. I suppose you're right. Yeah. Quentin Tarantino. He described it as the greatest shot in war history, cinema war history. Uh, the best shot in a war film. Basically. Yeah, I think that's a bit hyperbole there. There, there's. Uh, I think there's. I mean, it's it's hard to match, to be honest. Well, in terms I don't of know. One Apocalypse shot. Now, Apocalypse Now, the the um, helicopter the, attack. The, village, right, oh, the right, napalm. Ride of the Valkyries. Oh, I'd say. Oh, I'd say the napalm attack in Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now is better. All right. Well, so then, okay, then, then maybe that's two. <laughs> That's two, and then yeah, you know yeah, I think yeah. I, I don't know I, I I think that's getting a bit carried away, but okay. So another scene is I think yeah. all the, try all, harder, Christopher Nolan. Anything involving Spitfires, the dog fights are the yeah best the dog fights amazing. for sure they've got to be. I mean, and he it's... refused to do any CGI, so these are real mm. Spitfires. Yeah, the three aren't they the three remaining spitfires two are world. spitfires i was reading about this two are spitfires one is a sort of reconditioned other type of plane that was made to look like oh, a spitfire oh, okay. Okay. Even fields, they'll come out of the sun And I mean, they're fantastic. Mm. That, that, that it's, seems it's, great. It's yeah, the the, the dogfight. They're just the best. So I probably have to put that first dogfight as the best. When he says, "I'm on him." Yeah. Okay. Um, That's great. Oh, well, then I have one more. One more that <laughs> I loved. And feel free to chip in with your own. But my the, I was watching this again, and I have to confess, and. This is something I have a habit of of doing. My my wife will attest to this, is that I burst into tears. <laughs> well, that's, that's the same thing I cry. 
I don't burst into <laughs> tears, but I cry right. in everything. And okay. I cried when when the little ships appear and Branna says, what is it? Uh, uh, I think James Darcy says, what is it? And Branna mm-hmm. says, home. Yeah. And all these little ships arrive and it's to the sound of Elgar's Nimrod. Well, is it Elgar's or is it Hans Zimmer's version? It's a, a, a Ham Zimmer's version of Elgar. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. That's and, when I think that that scene is when everyone, Nigel Farage and all his supporters probably stood up in the cinema and clapped. Oh, bloody hell. Now you've lumped me in with <laughs> Nigel Farage. You bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, um, I was taken hook, line and sinker then. I, was... yeah, I mean, it's fantastic. It's great. And, 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 you know, I really like it when he's like, are you from Deal? And they're like, do it or something you know really? <laughs> <laughs> they're telling telling him where they've all come from <laughs> yeah it, it's it is moving that is very moving i mean it's uh it is a great moment scene i would say i do think that the the, the attack on the ship uh when they are at night time when they've just had their jam on bread and it's yeah, and great. it tilts you know and, and he does it he shoots it in such a <laughs> original way um i think there's another one that could be up there for me uh, so what are we going to go for then what's what's going to be the however best i would i i personally would go for the dog fight for sure yeah i think i'll go with that dog fight because it's so good. amazingly yeah. chorus and, and real you know <laughs> but what's interesting is that all those scenes we've mentioned they mm. don't involve dialogue or if there is dialogue no. No, there's very little. Just goes to show you shouldn't necessarily have dialogue in movies. Well, I just I think this also means this film doesn't do di- it's not about the script, really. No. No, it's the spectacle. It's it's you know the editing, it's the I mean it's the cinematography, it's fantastic. Should we skip shot. it one but was it even nominated for best screenplay? Uh, that would be um, bizarre. No, it wasn't. No. And that's fair enough, I think. Yeah. Okay, so next category is most unlikely scene. Now, this is the this is the mm. Argo Award for most unlikely <laughs> scene, okay. named after the famous event where Ben Affleck completely lied in his film. Much mm. as we love Argo, yes. but um, this is most unlikely scene, and I I I think undoubtedly this is the beach when he gets onto the beach. And the Branner says, Kenneth Branner at one point says, we've got to get 400,000 men off this beach. And you look at the beach and there's like 30 people on it. Like, where is everyone? Well, I I mean, at the beginning of the film where Finn comes out from the, the residential area onto the beach and the camera's behind him. I mean, you see a lot of people. Yeah, you, okay, I'm 30, I'm being mean. You probably see maybe a few. But of course thousand. he does. Yeah, but he doesn't. I don't think. I mean, you know, you could go. Well, there's a hell of a lot more up there, and there's a hell of a lot more over there. But at um, one stage, they're walking along the beach, and there's mm. literally no one. You can't see a soul. Apart oh, you from mean five. that the bit where they're going towards that boat? Yeah, but that that's not just the. I'm not using that as the only reason mm. why I think this is. It's that many of the shots I don't think show enough people, and I, I we mentioned atonement earlier. Mm-hmm. That scene captures it a lot better. I mean, there's these people everywhere. There's there's the military vehicles discarded. There are you know like trucks and, and artillery pieces all over the place. The, the yeah, you beach... see, that's the circumstance where Nolan could have used CGI. Yeah, which he doesn't like people. doing. Yeah, I mean, the beach in Dunkirk is. Des- you'd want to go. You'd want to go and put your towel out and get the get the, the get the sandcastle <laughs> out. It's it's too pristine. Interesting. I didn't think of that actually. Then all the many times I've watched the film, I I do have a question that I don't know whether this could be uh, this can qualify as most unlikely scene. But why on earth does Tom Hardy set fire to his plane? That's quite easily answered. I think he's uh, he doesn't want the Germans to get it. Yeah, but they're right there. They come and get him at the end. Yeah, but had he not and done it, that, they'd have got the plane. To me, that that's blatantly alerting his presence. Oh, I think if you've Germans. got a plane landing on a beach, they wouldn't, because uh, they were right on the, you, the Germans had surrounded Dunkirk. They would have mm. been able to see that 
quite easily, I think. I would have ditched it in just in offshore. Well, that might have been a sort of suicidal mission. What, sort of the cowardly Tom Hardy? <laughs> yeah, he was a bit of a... <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm not buying that, I'm afraid. I, I think that's no. fair enough. No, I was just, that's that's why I said it's probably not, it, it may not qualify as most unlikely. But... I'm just trying to think what else. But I just think, you know, it was a bit of a missed opportunity on the beach scene to make it, particularly only a few years before having seen Atonement and that shot, which is so mm. impressive. And he... Yeah. He, he uh, I think he, I think that was a missed opportunity. I really do think that you would have. Okay, so I'm going to mention this. My, my cousin's grandfather. So that's my uncle's father-in-law. Mm-hmm. Was at Dunkirk, and right. and I remember asking him about it, and he just said it was just horrific, absolutely awful, and we didn't go into detail in the conversation about it. But I didn't get the impression that, you know, it was nice flat beach with with orderly, orderly single file lines. And but didn't they shoot it? It was a lot more chaotic, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which but I don't I, think yeah, the yeah. chaos of the beach is is, expl- is portrayed ac- uh, accurately enough for me. Yeah, I mean, it depends on I, I don't know the but it's it's. You know, Nolan's capturing it at very particular times as opposed to a generalised, you know, Finn arrives, they're trying to get in, I think, in lines and, you know, and he joins a line and has said, no, Grenadiers only, mate, or something. Uh, So he has to go away. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that happened. I'm not saying that didn't Mm. happen. But it just it, it's it just, a difficult it, film for unlikely scene, you know, in terms of because unlikely scene to me is like, you know, that would never happen. Um, like in Argo, basically. Well, unlikely it, like, is a little bit qualified. Happen. So, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, it, it could it, it, the Argo one is that was a bull face lie. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas there's whereas no this real is, lie in this film. Yeah, no, um, I, I'm not. I'm, mm. I don't want to accuse it. I'm certainly not doing that. <laughs> I'm just saying that it could have been a little bit more chaotic. Okay, because I can't should, put my finger on any other been. scenes. So, so, so we'll go with that. You'll we'll go with that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, where are we? Done best performance, then most unlikely. But done best scene, best unlikely scene. Now, legacy. Now, it's had a hugely power. It was sort of rewritten yeah. the script on war films, hasn't it? Has it? I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't really. I don't think it's rewritten the the way they're made. I quite like the opening, for example, of Saving Private Ryan, um, which basically changed the way the camera was used to to capture chaos you know without saving private ryan we probably wouldn't have things like the born the way the born films were shot but i think it's it's definitely got an, a legacy because of because of the subject matter and because also just the way he's it's rather unconventional at, Na- the narrative the way he he tells the story uh, and with it I making think... 500 million pounds at the box office yeah that I don't means think... a hell of a lot of people saw it absolutely exactly <laughs> yeah i don't think other filmmakers would have been able to do it the way he did it i, I saw in interviews that, that that year actually that when the there were panels for those that were nominated for the oscars so there was a panel with greta gerwig christopher nolan Paul Thomas Anderson for Phantom Thread, uh, Guillermo del Toro. And it was Paul Thomas Anderson who said, you know, when I watched Dunkirk, I just said, how the fuck did he do that? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, and I would do these, watch these scenes. I just kept saying, how the F did he do that? And he does have that capacity as a filmmaker. You yeah. just kind of go, how on earth? Uh, who Quentin Tarantino has spoken about how impressed, mm. like he 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 thinks that this is one of his favorite films of the decade, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, I think he said it was like number his second favorite film that of that decade. Yeah, um, and I do think it's because it needs to be viewed more than once. I think if people who just saw it once in the cinema, they kind of a lot of people may have just gone, yeah, it was really yeah. It was, it's really entertaining and and suspenseful and uh, but it's not like you know amazing. I do, but I think if you watch it again, 
you yeah you, you definitely change your opinion of it definitely agree so listeners watch it again if you've watched it i think even if you watch it three times watch it again I, i've watched it i think this <laughs> i think i've watched it four times now yeah i've watched it four or five i think probably and it's so good and I, I'd have he's to- he's he he's he's one of those you kind of like it's a uh, how do, uh, easiest way to put this is he's a sort of director that does suspense where you're on the edge of your seat but you're it's not that you're on the edge of your seat suddenly it's like you slowly move from the back of your chair to the to the edge but gradually it's kind of like and that's the way he cross he, he's a he loves this cross cutting editing style he's done it in inception he's done it in interstellar he's done it in this i think he's done it in the dark knight it's a thing he does where you're kind of like straining with the suspense going, uh, when's the climax coming? <laughs> Which is very clever. I don't know any other director that does it. Um, it's, yeah, And the score contributes to that. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and, and so I think we think that was uh, robbed at the Oscars. Hmm. For... Right. So Tim, that's been fantastic. Thank you very much. Listeners go out and watch. Tom Kirk for the third, second, third, fourth, fifth time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, coming up next month, Tim, we're going to be talking Bloody Sunday, which will coincide with my interview with Peter Taylor, the legendary BBC journalist who's covered the Troubles since since Bloody Sunday, which is what we're going to be talking about. Can't wait. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Ollie. Thank you very much for listening. Coming up, it's Napoleon and his generals and much more, including the Royal Nazis, the Troubles, the Battle of Waterloo and a chat about the Eastern Front during the Second World War. Please rate and review. But in the meantime, thank you and good night. 